Okay, uh, we're going to start start now, and we we have a couple of panelists who will who will also join in a couple of moments. Uh, my name is Siddharth D'Souza, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Tilburg University. And the panel this afternoon is on regulating tech sector transgressions in the EU. Before we begin, uh, I wanted to mention that that while the, while the panel speaks and the panel title speaks about the EU, the conversation we're going to have today is actually much broader, and we have a really a uh, uh, wonderful set of speakers who come from different parts of the world and also with different expertise. Uh, but as we begin the conversation today, I want to say a little bit about the project that we're working on at the Global Data Justice Project, which is on sector transgressions. The idea behind sector transgressions is to be able to track how firms that establish themselves in one particular sector use their computational infrastructure to be able to creep as well as pivot into a new kind of sector. Uh, we started the project drawing from the work of Tamar Sharon, and over the last year have been trying to explore how these transgressions are not one-off events, but instead are events that take place over a period of time and end up crowding out expertise. Uh, one of the things that has struck us um, in the past year is that se sector transgressions are different from regular types of growth for businesses, different from innovation. And what has emerged is this idea that one, it's the context of the pandemic and the context of timing. Secondly, it's also a question of, of how these transgressions have taken place. Is it a question of government invitation? Is it a question of uh, companies being given legitimacy through political connections? And it's also a question of how companies have used their market to abuse uh, positions of dominance. So uh, what we have uh, today is a, a conversation which we hope will be able to, to understand the sec this phenomena of sector transgressions and, and to see whether this phenomena exists in different jurisdictions. And I'm really happy today to have uh, with us uh, Mariana Rielli, who is the General Project Manager at Data Privacy Brazil, uh, I have Ojdan Sabah, who's uh, a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam. I have Aaron Martin, who, who works with me at the Global Data Justice Project, as well as Scott Skinner-Thompson, uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Colorado uh, Law School. And Usha Ramanathan, who I think will join us shortly, who is an independent research and human rights activist uh, in India. Uh, so what we hope today is to also look at the question of what does sector transgressions do in terms of the dependencies it creates. We're interested in dependencies in terms of economic and functional dependencies, uh, which results in how sort of power concentrating emerges in, in, in particular spheres in terms of creating infrastructures. We're looking at ethics transgressions, where companies who do not have the expertise are ending up dominating how public sector questions are, are sort of emerging, for instance, in the question of public health. We're also looking at questions of political dependencies and civic dependencies. And how we would like to structure the conversation today is around a series of questions. We will begin uh, by, and I would like to invite uh, Mariana and then Ujdan, Aaron and Scott. Uh, to, to reflect firstly on, on how they see the concept of sector transgressions in their own work and in their own regions, and if they can do so by, by starting with an example of a case that they see. For instance, in our work so far, uh, which has been supported by the EUAI Fund, one aspect that has emerged repeatedly has been the ways in which public health, the public health sector has been transgressed by security firms such as Palantir but also transgressions taking place in ed tech, uh, transgressions that are also taking place uh, in logistics. And, it, and th these are some of the sectors that we've been looking at across nine countries in the EU. And we would also like this conversation to, to explore how uh, similar, similar transgressions are taking place in different parts of the world. So uh, as we begin, I'll invite Mariana uh, to start. Mariana, over to you. Hi, can you guys hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, good afternoon. For me, it's morning still. 
Uh, it's very good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'm like, you have already introduced me. Uh, thanks for that. But I'm Mariana Rielli. I work at uh, Data Privacy Brazil Research Association. And over the last few, um, maybe a little over a year, we have been conducting research on the it's hard to use the word legacy of COVID because it's not over yet. Uh, but the idea, uh, the, 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 the general initial idea of this research was to investigate how government in Brazil at all levels, so not just uh, federal government, but also at the state level and at the municipal level, um, has um, adopted different types of data, personal data based technology to fight COVID-19. Uh, and we didn't really start with the idea or with the concept of sector transgression, like in terms of our methodology, this was not something that was necessarily in the picture. Uh, but uh, as the research progressed, we, um, we had some uh, indications, some um, results that uh, pointed in this direction. And we have actually engaged with the Global Data Justice Project and with some of you, we have had conversations and even inputs uh, into our research. So to answer the question, I think in Brazil, this is huge because historically, um, basically every social thought book, uh, Brazilian book, uh, will say that the public in Brazil is private. And of course, this doesn't have to do necessarily with companies, but more with the dynamics of these uh, players and how um, these relationships developed over time. Uh, but so, so there are many possible examples, and I will keep to our own research because this is where I think I have more to contribute, which is the, like I said, the public health um, sector. And we found that um, nearly 60% of all suppliers of technology uh, to government, like I said, at all levels are uh, in the private sector, mostly technology companies. Actually, there is one company that accounts for almost 20% of all initiatives that we uh, were able to map. And um, we we are still not, I think, at a point where we can say that um, there has been, or there, there's, there, there's an actual transgression because we haven't looked at the, the history perhaps and the journey of these companies like in their different sectors, but we have some, um, like I said, indications that this may be happening. Um, and these are th this is what has been moving us to towards continuing this research. And basically uh, what we found was that, um, that the three most uh, common uh, functionalities, because we mapped different functionalities, so we're not looking just at like contact tracing, we were looking at the broader uh, scenario and the three most common were uh, social iso isolation um, monitoring was the first one, then uh, telemedicine and Third was um, the monitoring of a temperature, temperature, use of thermal cameras. And there are big differences between those three because the third one, I think it's very interesting that the companies that are responsible are not Brazilian while the others are mostly Brazilian companies. And in the case of thermal technology and facial recognition technology, the companies are mostly Chinese. Um, but the thing that we noticed was that the the the, the arrangements, the the contracts were mostly uh, at no cost for the public entities, and this is something that appears a lot in research. How these companies provide this uh, 
solutions without cost at first. And we are not at the point where we can affirm that this will change, but this is also an indication of something that may be happening and we are following this closely. So I think I'll stop here just to say that we are working uh, on the public health sector. And of course, another one that is very important in Brazil is public security. And we may go into that later, but I'll start, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mariana. Uh, Ojdan, maybe if I could ask you if, if, if you'd like to also reflect on the phenomena of sector transgressions and perhaps also connect to, uh, as Mariana mentioned, the idea that do you see this question of the public being private also uh, in the regions that you've been looking at? Yeah, so uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me on this panel. It's been very interesting to hear Mariana's uh, reflection on the concept of sector transgression, because I can also see some similarities there with the Global Data Justice Associates project, which I'm working on, which is uh, sector transgression in East Africa. Um, just a brief introduction there. So in partnership with uh, Data for Change, uh, this project looks at uh, cases of transgressive technologies in Ethiopia, Kenya and Uganda. And I was humbled to work with Kinfeil Ma, Grace Montungu and uh, Daniel Mwesigwa, who are experts on law and tech and who examine these cases. And I think one important thing is when we make the concept of sector transgression go global, uh, we also have to understand the, the position of these regions in this highly connected society. And what the researchers brought really uh, broadened the concept in two ways. So first of all, it really put to the forefront the it, it did not only focus on tech firms, but also on this complex relation between telecom and tech. That was one, one side of it. And the other side of it is that it emphasized the role of development agencies and uh, tech philanthropy, which, which is something that might not be as visible if we looked at, at uh, sector transgression only from a high income country perspective. So one example there would be that in Ethiopia, there is um, a project called John Snow, which is a health information system, and it led the pandemic response in many ways. So they monitored, you know, health sanitizers availability, tracked uh, the health checks of uh, travelers entering Ethiopia. They provided information about uh, the, the yeah, health education through WhatsApp helpline. And what's interesting here is that they were brokered through USAID and they worked closely with the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation. And above all, this, this Jon Snow uh, firm did not start with the pandemic. It predated the pandemic. It started in 2015 uh, uh, under, the, under the, you know, um, the idea of uh, providing a health information system in Ethiopia. And because Ethiopia has this longstanding relationship with international partners, uh, it was not framed in terms of, you know, pandemic response back then, but it was framed in terms of digital inclusion and in terms of, you know, economic development. So that is to say that, you know, when we look at sector transgression, we also see that it's continuation of things that have been happening in the past. Thanks a lot, Ojidan. I think you bring up an important distinction with, with also how the project has has been framed in the in the EU with the focus on the pandemic and and the changes that have taken place there, but to sort of speak to a longer a longer narrative and and I think this is also a good opportunity to bring in Usha Ramanathan. Uh, we've been talking about how in different regions of the world the the phenomena of sector transgressions manifests in different ways and also manifests at different points in time, and I was wondering if you could share. Uh, from India, uh, how, how do you see this uh, this phenomena uh, emerging? Is it something that has been around for a while? And, what, and have you seen any sort of important examples in the last couple of years during the pandemic that that have been different from from the past? And we can't hear you. There's a speaker right at the bottom of the screen.
and now yes perfect yeah okay okay i'm a little uh, uh, ner- nervous about entering this conversation because i'm not sure i've understood uh, sectoral transgression correctly so let's just say i'm giving another take on it yeah so uh, if it is about see one of the things we i think we spoke about it the last time too that uh, technology persons and technology and people who are leveraging technology for their business are not satisfied with finding an area where they can be they are very keen to take as much as they can because tech now is not about any sector it's about data and data from any sector is exciting for them so there is there are no boundaries in this second thing in the, in india it's uh, i'm sure there are other countries like this where the relationship between uh, tech com- you know tech interests i won't call them companies they are tech interests and the government uh, it's very close so there are things that tech uh, you know the tech interest promises the state and you know promises the government and the government uh, creates a good ambience for uh, tech uh, for the tech interest to do whatever it is that they want to do in india it is represented most starkly and most uh, clearly in this thing called the iceberg which is the uh, it's an industry round table it's like we had the nascom which was made up of uh, you know it was a association of all the big tech companies and then they decided that you know some of the smaller guys needed to come in and it, it you know it shouldn't be just amazon and facebook and google and what have you so they thought that they would create other products so the whole thing became about creating products for the first when it, when they first began and then it got hijacked by the id project that we had and creating what they called were stacks so these stacks are not these stacks are applications and they can and the idea was that it will create a platform and the, the and it will create the infrastructure and anybody can use it to create any kind of business that they want so actually i'm not sure therefore that they really uh, that the companies have been necessarily looking at it as something that is uh, sectoral but the state has been looking to bring everything on to these so that data can be collected from everywhere it's using the muscle power of the state to be able to collect data from so if i were just to give a few illustrative uh, things it's now in agriculture it's in finance is the fintech and uh, but it's not only fintech it's also the whole welfare state is done only through this it's in fast tag which is the toll uh, collection it is in uh, registration of uh, driving licenses and in registration of vehicles uh, which are which data by the way is what they told them in parliament that they are selling this data for a certain sum uh, most recently they have been saying they want to link up the voter id with uh, the id database uh, it's in uh, the covin app which is supposed to be holding all the information on uh, you know you can only get yourself vaccinated if you go through the covin app or whoever vaccinates you will have to put you on the covin app and there is a set of information that's held there which then converts itself into a uh, health id if you give your uid along and if you give the id along with it uh, there's a social security code which says that all unorganized sector people uh, have to get themselves onto this database with a whole range of information including the tax information and uh you know the id information and the telephone number and all the rest of it if they are to get anything at all if the state at any time decides that they want to help them through a time of distress so this is just a continue distress has provided an opportunity to speed these things up and to mo- use more coercion and to threaten exclusion but this is a pattern that we've been seeing over the past uh, past 10 years just two things that were that seemed pretty interesting one is that you know we have this uh, id system the uid uh, system which was done like a joint kind of thing between private industry by bringing in a marketing honcho from within uh, tech industry and the government and they they the whole project was run through this now it's about 11 years 12 yeah it's about 12 years since the project began and they had in november a meeting where two of the guys who are i mean all of them spoke but in, in one session which was on digital economy you had the, the two people who were from government and who had worked on this id project speaking there and saying that 
uh, this project had actually been promoted saying that this is so that the poor can have an identity and they should be able to get their whatever they been you know whatever is due to them so you have them now saying that listen this was never about the state it was never for the government it was for creating a digital economy and it's got hijacked by the state and they are holding it captive so there is a there is a way in which they saying that the state's job was just to create this these databases so that we can create businesses out of it so that the general gdp will go up and this is not the first time they are doing it this it happened earlier when they said that privacy is not a fundamental right it's not a right at all because if it's going to be a right it's going to be a problem so just uh, one uh, one thing therefore is that the, the i think the place where we are seeing a uh, large number of players come in and there is a certain amount of anxiety which we can see around us now uh, apart from the fact of being in all these various databases and having to identify yourself through them and be watched by somebody else who you don't know uh, apart from all of that the fintech uh, explosion particularly is causing an enormous amount of anxiety because various people are getting onto it i mean tech people are getting onto the fintech revolution which basically they are looking at banks and their legacy data and wanting to usurp that data and make what they will of it they created a money movement uh, agency which is outside of government and outside most regulations so that and the government has been the prime mover i mean the the prime marketer of that and the prime minister has been the prime marketer of that so and in this in each of these especially in the fintech sector you find that amazon and google and facebook and everybody is walked in so while the intention apparently is to say that you know we need our own we need to make our own businesses and we can't rely on advertising because we don't have that kind of budgets here but we do need all these databases and they should be ours which means the indian tech interest ours is not the people of india it is the indian tech interest and therefore you know we need to fight off all these amazons and googles and whoever else actually they're creating you know various scenarios where those guys come and do the major part of the business so this is the kind of semi complex scene that we are in now and i'm not sure if this is what you meant but this is i think obsessing my head so i just said it no thanks a lot i think i i, I think you also raise a question and 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 maybe adrian you can come in here about about how useful uh the idea of sectors is to think about uh transgressions as you say but, so maybe that's one thing aaron that, that that you can begin with but also the second aspect that you raise about about the question of state capture and the capture of state institutions and what this actually means for the dependency of 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 the public sector um aaron perhaps if you could share from uh from the work that is being done in the eu if 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 you see similar questions emerging sure Thank you, Sadar. Can you hear me? Yeah, wonderful. No, so uh, it's actually a great time for me to sort of react to the conversation so far. And indeed, one of the questions we're grappling with in the EU focus component of the of the research is whether it still makes sense to talk about the tech sector as a, as a sort of distinct area of innovation, um, of sort of business growth. Whether you know over the past sort of ten years, and in particular during the pandemic. Uh, we've seen the sort of tech sector invade pretty much any, every other sector um, that matters, uh, especially from a re regulatory perspective. And I, I don't think we've sort of come to a, a sort of final answer on this. We're still debating internally whether um, there's value in still sort of holding on to this notion of a, of a, a distinct tech sector, in particular because, um, at least for me, at least, I have a fear that when when we kind of say that the tech sector is everywhere, that the Amazons of the world, that the Googles of the world are basically like uh, they're no longer tech firms; that they're sort of you know um, these these monsters that that operate across sectors. That we we kind of lose sight. Of that we can 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 sort of sharpen our our hooks in terms of regulation. Um, there's a lot of regulatory activity in Europe, in particular around as we discussed today, digital services, digital markets. Uh, the governance of data of different kinds, uh, and I think it helps that the starting point for a lot of those conversations is this collective understanding that um, that the tech sector is a thing, right? That it's not uh, that it's not a sort of a, a figment of of, of the past, um, and that we can identify actors within both the sort of regulatory community, but I think more broadly civil society that can uh, help to rein in. Uh, particularly transgressive behavior by 
by tech companies, right? Even though they operate in, for example, finance, um, education, agriculture increasingly and so forth. So um, I think this notion of, you know, it, what is the tech sector still and does it make sense to, um, to, to conceive of some of these issues as being sort of tech driven uh, is an important one. But I also want to react to something that Mariana said. And I think this is where this question of sort of what can be done and what's the role of sort of civil society and other uh, actors is quite important. So she mentioned that in Brazil, a lot of the innovation during the pandemic um, was by sort of firms uh, using sort of Chinese sort of innovations of different kinds. And I find this sort of this question of like the, the geopolitical interests um, and, and sort of suspicions or concerns around uh, the, the sort of the national homes of, of certain tech companies important because at least in Europe, we see that there's still this push against American and Silicon Valley in particular uh, interests, although the problems are much broader. But I think elsewhere in the world, there is this concern around China, India uh, as well. Um, and I think where where we can use some of those uh, sort of national interests or, or, or concerns around the geopolitics of, of technology in order to resist this, this sort of uh, expansion of, um, dare I say, illegitimate technology or, or technology that perhaps uh, has been developed in Sort of a vacuum uh, um, during during the pandemic, um, where perhaps you know we haven't uh, followed all the procurement procedures for different reasons, where we still haven't answered some questions around accountability, um, exclusion, and so, uh, 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 so forth. It's sometimes nice to have the geopolitical card to play, right? Where we can at least use that as a way to to push back certain kinds of um, behavior by by the sector, as it were. And just one final point, if I may, Siddharth. This, um, this question of no-cost contracts, I think, is really important, just a Brazilian phenomenon. It's something we've seen in Europe as well. Um, and this is actually where it becomes a lot harder to understand what's happening in terms of government procurement of systems, because uh, at least when you know there's contracting in place where, where governments are paying for, for systems and services, we have the paper trail, we have the, the due diligence that's required um, for, for government spend. And where things are being offered for free, we see this a lot in the humanitarian sector as well, that makes it much harder to understand, um, you know, the sort of the, the terms of agreements. Uh, there's a lot of currency because things are offered for free. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of hoping that we can think further uh, about what does it mean to offer sort of a, a platform or a uh, during a, an emergency context, in an emergency context, rather, uh, even for a temporary period, uh, at no cost, uh, and then you know what, what that sort of allows for pushback, um, transparency, uh, and resistance uh, by by a range of actors. So I hope that helps in terms of a reaction to the points made so far. Thanks, Aaron and and Scott. Maybe I'd, I'd like to bring you here to also react to a point that Aaron made uh, towards the end of this idea of of illegitimate technology, uh, whether it's to do with questions of procurement, whether it's to do with the ways in which uh, accountability is sort of these organizations. And I was wondering, in in your uh, reflections on 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 tech expansion during the pandemic, um, how would you sort of distinguish? transgressions from 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 innovative activities from business as usual and what is an effective counter to this understanding that that the ways in which uh, tech uh, companies are actually moving into new areas of business is is part and parcel of their business model yeah uh, thanks thanks so much uh Siddharth, and, and thanks to, to everybody. Um, it's really uh, great to be part of this conversation. And I believe we're on at least four different continents at the moment, which is uh, um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, um, I, I, the, the conversation is really interesting. I think I think that my um, my initial reactions, and, and this is not to suggest that that government surveillance is is indeed um, better than this privatized capitalist surveillance that we're seeing. Um, grow with and accelerate because of the conditions of the pandemic. But I do think that one background condition um, that has enabled this uh, privatized um, surveillance creep or transgressions is is the the is the the norm of neoliberalism and the the, the failure of uh, um, 
governments to be in the business of providing services anymore. And so I, I think that that background condition is one that we need to bear in mind because it is the one, you know, all of these different examples, and there's some really good ones, are enabled by the the, the failure of, of government uh, to, to do its job. Ed tech is a, is a good example. Schools do not have the resources to serve children. So Google comes in and says, here's a Chromebook, you know, and, 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 and starts surveilling our, our children. Um, and, it, and this is true in any of the, exam, any of the, you know, if we're talking about contract tracing, whatever, um, it's the failure of government, which has been primed, which, which, exists in part because of the tech company's ethos of deregulation, of privatization, not just tech companies, but obviously corporations across the board that has created uh, this this gap in governance um, and services, which is in turn um, allowed these transgressions uh, to accelerate with, uh, you know, dramatic fashion. Um, and so I think that that is important, which is, you know, I, I think we have to attack these, uh, you know, not attack, but um, call out and, and combat these symptoms. But I do think it's important to to, to realize this is part of a broader phenomenon of, of liber neoliberalism and, and privatization. Um, and I think this relates very closely and, and, and is potentially, you know, one solution uh, building off of um, Aaron's point about geopolitics. And I think we have to be careful here not to be, I'm not suggesting this is where Aaron was headed, but but be careful not to be, you know, sort of nativist in our approach to, to, to these discussions. But at the same time, to the extent that there is an opportunity to suggest to, to countries, okay, if you care about your sovereignty, right, then one way in which to protect that sovereignty is to be in the position, in the business of providing um, government services yourself so that when there is a crisis, you do not have to depend on either private or public goods from uh, an, another country, um, wh whether, whether that be, you know, uh, my, you know, my, my neighbors to the West in, in Silicon Valley or um, uh, uh, China. Um, and so I think that that's, that's a, a potential, uh, uh, you know, helpful linking of those um, issues. So uh, those are sort of my initial uh, thoughts. Um, I, I do think the concept is, is really helpful from a descriptive standpoint um, to help understand uh, the degree to which, um, you know, companies, and, and, and again, to, to other people's points, not just tech companies, but all, many companies now are surveillance capitalists and um, the, the commodity is um, information and surveillance. I would, uh, in terms of, you know, shaping norms, right, we've allowed our, ourselves to be shaped by um, some of these companies. And, and, and I think we need to resist some of the nomenclature that they've imposed on us um, at turns. And so even, you know, the idea that these are no cost, no cost can't contracts or free is just, is just inaccurate from a, from a descriptive standpoint, like that, that, that not, you know, the old saying is nothing in life is free. Right. And, and it's not free, right. There, there's a huge cost. And so I think we need to um, be sure when we're labeling them to say, you know, they're, they're the ones that want this. Right. And that's because they are, um, extraction in, in, in industries, extracting information, and um, uh, so what? What do they need to provide in in exchange for that um, extraction? Um, uh, so those are my initial thoughts. But I really, I'm really happy to be part of the conversation. I look forward to learning more. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Scott. Um, Mariana, if I can bring you back into the conversation and. Maybe to also speak to the to to one of the points that, that Scott made in terms of of thinking about institutional and public sector responses, particularly as as he describes when 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 government capacity is 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 non-existent in 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 certain domains, uh, in 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 Brazil and in the work that 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 you're doing, uh, what what role do you see? For us, uh, for civil society and for for regulators to be able to 
to respond both at, in, in times of a pandemic, but also uh, in terms of a longer, uh, a longer sort of more embedded response to the fact that institutional capacities need to be strengthened. Thanks. Um, okay, so lots of things that I want to react to, and I will try uh, to do my best. Uh, I think this this issue of uh, the public sector um, inability or lack of resource to provide. Sorry, there's noise here. Please let me know if you can hear me. I will try to move closer. Um, there is the, this issue in Brazil now that um, the government is acti actively trying to <laughs> kill the population. So it's not just a lack of resource, a lack of capacity. There's also a political project and the pandemic showed how the government was actually trying to divert attention and to not uh, act in any um, reasonable way. So it's kind of hard like right now to understand how all these um, many um, issues play out. But uh, what I was, I think, going to say and like kind of trying to answer your question about civil society, um, the main problem, the main um, limits, the main uh, difficulty that we faced with this research was uh, a trans transparency one both public and private transparency because we were researching um, um, technologies that had been acquired uh, by governments and that uh, even though we are in a pandemic and there have been some, um, there is some level of flexibilization in terms of um, the, the public procurement. Uh, the, 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 the thing is that after a year of research and over 600 uh, Freedom of Information <coughs> Act requests and lots of other um, attempts to gather information and to gather uh, these contracts, these agreements. At the end, we were able to um, acquire only half of all the, the initiatives that we know that took place because they, there was uh, talk in the media or even by government officials, but we were never able to locate uh, the, so it's not just the, the no cost uh, issue and the inability to have this paper trail, but like we, it, it's it's before, we, we couldn't even access like the basic um, outline of the, of these uh, agreements. And this is a huge problem because we can't say that it's something that the private sector is uh, responsible for or, or the public sector is re actually the public sector is, because is responsible for in this case um and so what we what we thought was more um useful and perhaps as a strategy to engage civil society and other organizations around this issue was to talk about transparency because uh people were more um impressed and and the impact was a greater when we said look we know there things are happening but we don't know exactly what they are because we can't have access to like like the basics something that should be public and we can't access that and this has garnered more attention and then we were able to go further into the discussions of um of the, the, the actual numbers and the sectors that are involved and issues of privacy, data protection, surveillance. But we started with the transparency thing because this is something that Brazilian civil society uh, in the last, I don't know, 10 years maybe has been uh, very, um, has been following very closely. So I don't know, this is just an example of something that we use to uh, garner attention and to engage people uh, around this subject because like in a scenario in Brazil where uh, civil society is faced with, and uh, not just Brazil, everywhere, but with so many problems and the government itself is always trying to divert attention and to, it's very hard sometimes to uh, 
uh, make people care about these things, especially when there's this um, framing of um, innovation and, and of something that can actually be good and people don't understand the implications. So I don't know, I, I just thought it would be useful to bring this experience to the table. and. Uh, but it's something that is very, uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do. So thanks, this is really helpful, both in terms of how you articulate the challenges of actually trying to do a monitoring and uh, uh, accounting of, of, of government and government in departments, but also the framing of, of such responses in terms of transparency uh, in order to build solidarity amongst different organizations. Ojdan, would this be something that you also see uh, in terms of civil society responses or, or have there been other ways in which civil society responses have been framed in response to um, tech expansionism? Yeah, so um, I, I can recognize the problem of opacity as something that we also see in our research. So yeah, advocating for transparency and making sure that the problem is there to the public eye is important so i'll talk as so as a researcher and academic i think also extending the scope and making it global and going beyond framings of privacy and ethics can also help in this scenario because it allows us to make visible these other actors and also identify where we can take actionable tasks and i think another thing because this sector transgression happened in the in the perceived emergency and uh the 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 rise from a pandemic, we could also um, pay attention to where this rhetoric has been used before. So in um, well, yeah, in regions where digital humanitarianism flourishes, so zones of conflict, places that are considered as perhaps economically or politically unstable or uh, border zones. And then we can learn from uh, grassroots movements there on how uh, that were directly impacted by these this transgressive uh, uh, technologies and uh, learn from their experience and see how perhaps they resisted or subverted, um, subverted these trends. And I think this is particularly important because we, I feel like we're going to be heading toward a lot of other emergencies with, with, the, with, the, with the problems that we will be facing with climate change. So I think, to have a more robust institutional responses to also listen to to grassroots movements and learn from from their activities. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Usha. Do you want to also come in here and on the point of of civil society responses, both in terms of challenges of 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 how to respond and also what possible framings could could be. Yeah, it's actually a little complex here, I think. I mean, differently complex. It's not any more or less complex. It's ter terribly complex everywhere. But uh, I think it's a little different in the sense that uh, when we address the tech issues here, we are addressing the state much more than we are addressing the companies because the companies are acting through the state. And uh, uh, what the, the, the obvious surveillance is being done by the state with the help of these uh, technology companies. And I was thinking when you, when, you know, on the question of sovereignty, for instance, I think Arun, you said this. Uh, I was thinking that actually it's very difficult here because, you know, even in, our, uh, even in some of the major state projects that they have, which, is, which are surveillance projects, they are not able to find, the state is not able to find uh, people who will join the state, I mean, join a, take up a job with the state to, uh, for instance, be a security officer who will make sure that data security is maintained. So they have to then, you know, give this work out. It's all about startup and, uh, you know, giving the work out to everybody else. So it's not about establishing systems as much as being opportunistic. And that's the way we are now. So the, the way to do it is, in a short time, get as much as you can, put it all together because the unfortunately it's like a rush to the bottom. So it's also saying it's also a competition with the really bad guys. I mean, you're, you're talking about reining in the power of all these big corporations. And if you're competing to say, okay, I can't have that kind of power, so I'll find another kind of power that will compete with with this power, then you know it's so for civil society, the 
uh, when you're addressing the state and the state doesn't listen and the state has the power to coerce, to mandate, to do whatever it wants, that's one kind of problem that we are faced with. But I think the good thing that I'm seeing now, and I think I uh, hear it in many of the meetings, is that there is a greater awareness that these are problems. Earlier, it was, you know, seeing tech as a problem because it seemed so obscure. Uh, it, it was hidden. It wasn't that clear. But increasingly, we are hearing people saying, listen, we do need to do, you know, we can't just walk into this with our eyes shut. So that's been one good thing. And then there are groups that have formed over this, you know, over the past 10 years, uh, which are making legal cases out of many of these. And they are really working at uh, pushing back. They are working at, uh, you know, getting the courts and judges to understand. And that's a huge problem because, you know, we, are, we go through so many discussions to understand what we are faced with. And judges just have to hear it from lawyers who themselves have no clue. And you have to be training them on, you know, what needs to be. So it's it's a real, uh, it's not a happy place to be. But people are working at it and lawyers are getting trained in understanding technology. The younger lot. And that's a huge help. So there's more discussion. But uh, the unfortunate thing, and I think sometime we might need to make this link to, and I, I mean, I'm sure we have, but I'm saying that between philanthropy you know, who are the richest guys today? Who is giving the money? And what are they giving the money for? And what, what do they ask in return? I think that's querying the pitch quite a lot. And I think we, you know, we need to figure out what to do about that. Because if you look, there is a recent article where uh, a chap has written about all the things that have happened on this India stack kind of thing, which is what all these applications are that are being created. All of, the, uh, all of them are being done by a tech baron who's got pots of money and who's therefore get, you know, getting people on to do this, create all these products. And then he has access to the state and he, what, what his, in his language, he evangelizes it to the state. So then we are stuck with, you know, the, and there is a huge crackdown in India on people getting funds. So it's like, it's a lot of things coming together, therefore. When you say trans, you know, in intersectoral, I mean, it's really like superbly intersectoral. So one last one word, if I might, just as a thing, because I'm very curious about this thing of innovation and the idea that, uh, you know, we, we are all rights activists in, in many ways. But the idea that therefore the corporate entity should have more rights than all of us should have and that they will have the right not just to innovate, but to roll it out in our midst without any kind of, uh, you know, without asking us, without, you know, figuring out how it matters, no moratorium, no licensing, no nothing, if anything goes. I think this, uh, you know, I, idealizing of innovation, maybe we need to juggle that a bit and see what it really means. It's not the individual. It's about power. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that point up. And maybe this is something that Scott you'd like to respond to on the question of of innovation as power. And it was it also links to to questions that you spoke of before about government capacity. Well, thanks. Yeah, I think it's a really um, important point. Um, and I I. <laughs> I, I do think that there is an inertia, um, both rhetorically and, and in terms of um, all sorts of structures in, in favor of, uh, th that compel innovation, uh, sometimes for the sake of innovation without um, any sort of uh, deliberation um, or, or democratic input on um, on whether that innovation is harmful or not. Um, the, 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 as Usha was, was talking, the, the key example that came to my mind from the American context was the rapid proliferation of um, police worn body cameras that we've seen in the United States over just a really short period uh, of time. Um, and, and right, and in that context, you know, civil rights groups are, are are not of one mind on whether or not this is a, a an important check on, um, uh, you know, state power and, and racism or, or not. But um, what we've seen is, you know, 
pilot programs, um, and uh, you know they're, they're sort of rolled out in, in fast in, at a fast pace. Um, sometimes civil society is, is galvanized to work with the state um, to legitimize that, um, and um, you know the the response is is a bit more nuanced than the state uh, might lead us to believe. And so one example is that in, in New York City, where the when they were um, a few years ago rolling out their body camera uh, um, uh, pilot program, which of course is is is, is a product of <laughs> partnering with uh, the private sector and companies like Palantir and Axios, um, they they surveyed a bunch of New Yorkers, and you know the New Yorkers, including New Yorkers from from diverse uh, backgrounds, and the, their their responses to you know the conditions under which this technology should be uh, deployed were, were were very nuanced, right? You know that they, they had strong views about. Um, when the camera should be um, activated and when not, and access to uh, the videos after the fact, and who who you know when officers should be able to review the uh, videos, um, and so it wasn't a sort of blank check, right? That that that, that civil society and the public gave to the deployment of this um, this innovation, but New York City ran with the the top line response, which was, uh, you know, people approve of body cameras, okay. The conditions under which they approved of them were, were extremely multifaceted, and the conditions in, under which New York City deployed them were not in, in alignment with those nuanced perspectives, right? And so the top line was taken, legitimized the innovation, and then the innovation was deployed. And now, of course, you know, are there examples where police body cameras have um, captured police brutality and um, been used to, uh, you know, at least momentarily garner some measure of accountability for individual officers. Yes, there are examples of that. Are there also examples where this is uh, being used as a, as a, you know, innovative surveillance tool, which is further subjugating marginalized communities? Of course. And, and so, um, you know, I think sometimes the we see the innovation as a quick fix to the problem. Oh, how do we deal with police brutality? Well, let's get this video camera out. Well, the background question is, we have structural racism, oppression, and a video camera is not going to fix those conditions, right? But we we just latch on to the innovation, uh, as this was suggesting, uh, suggesting as, as, a, as a, a quick fix to longstanding structural problems. And then we use um, civil society and, and, and you know, quick... Um, uh, uh, basically crowdsourcing of public input to legitimize that in innovation when in reality the public response to that innovation is, is far more complex uh, than, than we may be led to believe. Thanks a lot, Scott. I think those examples are, are, are really compelling also to sort of problematize this whole idea of, of innovation. Since we're almost at time, uh, I'd like to do a, one round of, uh, of final reactions uh, from our panel. And, and maybe I can start with you, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Siddharth. And just to, to reiterate Scott's points uh, around sort of the... Um, this this idea that sort of text will so, tech will solve all of our problems, I agree one hundred percent. I mean, I think we all agree here that it's uh, it's quite easy and dare I say lazy sometimes to rely on technology or to expect technology to solve deep, more structural uh, problems. I mean, his, his previous point around um, the context in which you know some of these uh, sort of pandemic related technologies were being being deployed in the U.S. Um, really points to like. For example, the need to, to to address tax policy, right? Like, and to to ask hard questions about the availability of public sector funding to uh, to to respond to emergencies like uh, COVID nineteen. But of course, those are uh, not only harder sort of uh, problems to solve, but I dare I say, sort of uh, politicized in, in different ways. Um, and so technology certainly isn't the solution to most of our problems, if, if any of them. I will also just sort of uh, close by reflecting on, uh, I think, uh, 
but um, related to the politics of this question of innovation and resistance innovation uh, in the context of the pandemic, I'm reminded that we often find ourselves among strange bedfellows. Uh, just last weekend, there was a big protest in Brussels against, uh, in particular, sort of use of digital vaccination um, certificates uh, for accessing restaurants and, and, and bars and so forth. And while I think many of us here would probably have, you know, questions around, for example, um, the sort of legitimacy of certain technological interventions, uh, questions of, you know, the sort of the providers of the, the platforms that are being used for vaccination certificates in, in different countries. Um, I, I imagine most of them also generally be sort of um, in favor of the use of, you know, certain sorts of, of technological measures to manage public health, uh, to reduce risks of, of coronavirus, et cetera. So I think it's, it's, uh, what I'm trying to say is it's it's not that we're anti-tech or anti-innovation in, in our line of thinking in this project, but we're asking questions about, you know, when does innovation become it and what makes a technological innovation, in particular one um, that's provided exclusively by the private sector, uh, legitimate or not. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much, Siddharth. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Uh, Mariana, would you like to add some concluding thoughts? Yes, no, I think I would just like to thank you all and say that in one hour I have a lot of questions and uh, a lot of things that uh, I want to reflect on and also at the Privacy Brazil we will keep working on them and we hope that we will be able to continue this conversation, for example, on the... Um, on whether we should um, make this, this, this distinction of the a tech sector. I think this is a very hard question that made me think a lot during the webinar, and I have some thoughts on that. And I think we at Data Privacy as well, uh, considering the Brazilian scenario, and we would, of course, like to continue this conversation. Thank you very much to all. What's that? Yeah, so some concluding remarks. I wanna well, I wanna thank you for this insightful conversation. I think this made us all reflect on um, what was known as perhaps techno solutionism and how it progressed and how we we see this you know tech firms gaining more power and control here. And, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to 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 carrying on this conversation with you all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Usha, would you like to go next? Uh, just uh, two things, if I can come back to. One is a, slight, is a kind of response to what Aaron said. Uh, on, the, on this uh, vaccination uh, database, I actually have not defensive at all about opposing a global database on vaccination and asking that we should be showing this wherever we go because I don't see the agenda as being vaccination and health safety at all. I think it's an opportunity that's being created because actually we don't know enough about the virus. We don't know enough about the vaccination. I think science should focus on that and not allow tech czars to want us on a global database. And I mean, I can give you illustrations earlier of how they've actually spoken about this ambition of having everyone on a global database. I really think I mean, I'm really not defensive at all about it. I think such a database should not exist. And the uh, second slight thing is that it's on disruption. Uh, it's actually quite interesting to see what happens here. You know, disruption was meant to disrupt moribund systems, but they've actually become like burning the boats. So you burn your boats so that you have to get onto the system that I'm providing for you now, whether it works for you or not and whether it destroys all, all your rights or not. So I think the just like we interrogate the idea of innovation, maybe we need to interrogate the idea of disruption also. Thank you. Uh, and finally, Scott. Oh, gosh, well, it was a great conversation. I don't, I don't have uh, much further to add. I, I, as Usha was talking about, and I, it's, it's, it's a, um, you know, this, this final, uh, point about the vaccine um, uh, databases, I, uh, uh, something I, I need to give more thought about. But I, I, I will say one, you know, 
again, the impulse to track, right? Like, oh, we need to verify who has a vaccine or not. Part of the issue is that our social fat, the, the reason why we think we need that or, or why some people think we need that is, is because we the social fabric in, in many contexts, uh, certainly in the United States context, is so, um, so sprayed that there's an incredible lack of trust among people, among communities, um, uh, 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 between uh, among each other and between the people and, and the government, uh, that we think that um, that sort of command and control approach is, is the only thing that can solve it. And so, it, you know, to the extent that my remarks have a theme, it's that you know, there, there are these background problems um, that I think are so closely related to the surveillance issues um, uh, that, um, and I don't have solutions for them, but, but, but I think that they are are, are influencing uh, the conversation in important ways. But thank you again um, to all of you. I learned, learned a great uh, deal. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. I think this is this is a, a, a very quick one hour, but it, I think we covered a lot of ground. I, I think there's, there's several questions that you've raised in your final remarks starting from the question of whether uh, tech is a sector, the question of, of whether sector is actually a useful way of, of, of discussing such transgressions, the ways in which we can problematize uh, innovation, problematize uh, disruption, and also think about what are the ways and, and what are the challenges that actually emerge when we are creating a public sector dependencies and also enhancing opacity through the ways in which uh, this ecosystem around uh, having private sector offer public services um, creates. So thank you so much. And thank you so much to the organizers at Privacy Camp for giving us this opportunity. And uh, yeah, we're going to post a link to our work in case you are interested uh, and would like to follow it. Uh, we will have a report coming out in a couple of months. Thank you again.